Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Women in World Trade New England uh, session on international economic development and humanitarian aid. My name is Don Wivel, and I'm up in New Hampshire. I am on the board of Women in World Trade, and um, I have with us today our guests from CARE, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, and they're all over the country, including one who's actually on a road trip to Lake Tahoe, so she's in the car. Um, so I have been engaged in international trade for uh, actually, I hate to say this, 40 years, um, but I've always had a passion for international development and humanitarian work, um, and in particular as relates to the empowerment of women and girls. Um, and whenever I mention these um, areas, I have noticed that there's a, a great deal of interest on the part of the younger generation as well as those people who are, are more established and, and would you know, perhaps like to take their expertise into uh, development and into humanitarian aid. Um, so uh, we, I have actually been a care advocate um, and the state chair for care uh, for seven years. So I've been, um, had the uh, pleasure of working with them um, actually around the country and uh, I was chosen to go on a trip to Benin, Africa. So I've seen firsthand the amazing work that they do. I, I have to say that I enjoy very much meeting with my co-advocates around the country um, at, you know, every year. And while we have vastly different backgrounds and daily lives, uh, it's, like, it's like I'm meeting with my tribe and we've become great friends and it's an amazing group of people. So if anyone out there is interested in, in being an advocate for CARE, I uh, really hope that you'll contact me. Um, we need more advocates in New England and Savannah Fox, who's with us, actually is uh, you know, the person who heads up the advocacy for New England, so you'll get to meet her. So I um, would like to introduce our guest from CARE now. Um, we have, as I mentioned, Savannah Fox, who is our advocacy uh, leader for New England. Uh, Kellen Superlot, who is the Deputy Director of Strategy and Operations for CARE. And Allison uh, Shapiro, who is Manager of, of Digital, Ad advocacy, ugh, Digital Advocacy Content and Mobilization. So good morning or good afternoon, good noontime, <laughs> ladies. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I know you've just come off of uh, time off and Savannah, you're on vacation. So I really appreciate you joining us. Um, so I'm gonna start with Savannah and you can pass it off to your colleagues if you like. And if you could just um, tell us about the work that CARE does and um, you know a little bit about the background because it's quite fascinating. And um, also maybe a little bit about how your work might've changed during the pandemic. Sure. I'm going to say good morning because I'm out in Utah and it's morning. Um, like Don said, I'm the regional advocacy manager for CARE. So I get to work with, as she calls it, the tribe um, of folks in the Northeast that are advocates. Um, CARE has a really interesting background. So I think a lot of people have heard about CARE packages before. That actually originated with CARE. Um, we really got developed right after World War II um, in the crisis after uh, the war ended needing to respond to war in Europe. And so we started, the U.S. started sending care of education materials, food, um, because there was huge food insecurity, medicine, other objects that were needed um, across Europe. Uh, we have really developed. We just this past spring celebrated our 75th anniversary. Um, so one, we're one the largest international development organization. So, Savannah, I think we're losing you. Yeah, we're losing you. Turn your camera off, maybe? Oldest, um, and with that comes a lot of a lot of knowledge. We are now, after seventy five years, in over a hundred different countries around the world in response into full programmatic work. See, no. Me now. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Yeah, with the camera off, maybe. Okay. Um, I might have to pass it on to to Allison or Kellen to to finish up the the background. I'm not sure where I where I stopped um or where I got cut off, but. 
CARES in 100 different countries right now. We have deep programmatic work um, within the communities and we've gone from just humanitarian response into other deep programmatic work such as childhood education focused on women and girls, specifically food insecurity across the world. Um, and now with COVID-19, we're really ramping up our uh, fast and fair vaccine uh, campaign to make sure that the entire world is able to get their hands on vaccines. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has really given us a lot of challenges in our work. Um, one, just being able to reach the most um, underserved populations around the world, but also here in the U.S. where, uh, Don, like you were saying, our advocates usually meet with members of Congress. We gather together. Um, we have those learning experiences. We have those training experiences. And that's really all been put on hold um, and really been moved into the digital space. So I think we've actually learned a lot about accessibility within the last year, which is really exciting and some new skills and new tools that we're gonna keep you rough start, but uh, really adapted in, in the ground and our advocacy in the US. Allison, and maybe she can give a little bit more of an update on some of our key um, issue areas legislatively. Sure, thanks, Savannah. Um, yeah, so I think Savannah gave a really good overview of, of some of our core issues, um, really in everything we do centering it around women and girls. Um, they're, they're always at the center of our work. And so we have, um, you know, we're, we're working really hard with, you know, our advocates like Dawn and, and people on staff to pass U.S. policies and to secure U.S. funding that will really help women and girls in the underserved communities where we work around the world. Um, I would say, you know, the the kind of core pieces of legislation that we have are, are largely around, you know, ensuring that people have enough food, that people have, you know, nutritious, nutritious food around the world, um, that women and girls are protected from gender-based violence, that women and girls have access to um, reproductive and sexual rights and healthcare. Um, and then as Savannah mentioned, a really, really big part of our work right now is around COVID-19 vaccines and, and really ensuring that the U.S. is a leader um, in in the vaccine front, um, and that the U.S. Um, you know extends its um, you know extends a helping hand to, to folks around the world who can't have access to COVID nineteen vaccines. We know that we're really not going to be able to end this pandemic until uh, everybody is safe. Um, so um, so yeah, so I, I would say those are our, our major kind of issue areas and and. Uh, legislative priorities that we're working on right now. And I'm sure Kellen and Savannah and I will talk more about them as we continue talking. Oh, sorry, forgot to unmute myself. So I, um, you know, I just want to say that, that as an advocate, that's what we do primarily is to work with our congressional delegations uh, in, in each state to get um, legislation passed. Like the Food Security Act, I think took us eight or nine years to get passed. Um, International Violence Against Women Act, um, the uh, Mexico City Protocol. Uh, in our case, um, Jean Shaheen, who's my uh, one of our, our U.S. senators, uh, all of our entire congressional delegation is very supportive of CARE, um, but she's a, a, an absolute star. So I want to put a plug in for her. Um, and uh, I don't know if Savannah was going in and out of, of audio, but um, I just, I wanted to mention that we just had our 75th anniversary um, celebration. It was the, uh, what, 6 millionth care package um, um, that was shipped or, um, and I think it's interesting that the term care package comes from care. Um, but it was cool because we had every single living president except for Donald Trump there, um, Whoopi Goldberg hosted it. We had a lot of celebrities like Jewel and Angela Merkel was there. It was an amazing day. And usually we would have done it in person, but uh, you know, because of COVID, um, you guys did a great job doing this uh, virtually. So I, I just, for, for those who are interested in, in this type of work, um, tell me, um, we could start with Kellen since you haven't talked yet. What, uh, what, why did you choose this career path or, or what brought you to CARE? Sure. So um, I have always been interested in international women's and girls issues, especially education. So 
you know, was involved with that um, in college. I went, I studied international relations um, and did some of my research, like for my senior thesis on women and girls education, post-conflict humanitarian kind of studies. So it was always part of my interest. Um, and then when I graduated, I had a job with the Senator from Delaware. Um, and then after that, I actually worked for Vice President Biden when he was in vice, when he was vice president before he was president. Um, so I was with Vice President Biden and Dr. Jill Biden for about seven years after college doing a couple of different roles. Um, and then the administration ended. So I was kind of at a crossroads. I was out of a job, um, kind of cast a wide net in terms of where I wanted to apply. I was thinking about the private sector um, and also NGOs. I kind of wanted to take a break from government because I wanted to do something different. Um, and one of the people that I did an internship with back in college, her name was Nicole, worked at CARE, and she reached out to me. She said, hey, are you still looking for a job? Like, um, CARE is looking for someone that will help coordinate across our strategy. And so it was kind of like kismet because I had always been interested in this. And then there was an opportunity to join an advocacy team. And that was about four years ago. So I've been at CARE like since March of 2017 on this advocacy team. And what about you, Allison? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think I probably um, kind of stumbled into this career path more than chose, um, especially the humanitarian work. Um, you know, I didn't go to college expecting to, to do this kind of, of work. I went to college for journalism. But my first job out of college was um, at National Geographic, and that was my first glimpse at what working at a nonprofit was really about which is really mission driven work. And of course that mission was more, you know, related to science and education and environmentalism, but you know, everything I did was really centered around this mission of the society and I really really liked that. And so I I moved on to another nonprofit, I moved on to an ocean conservation nonprofit for about two and a half years after that. Um and then um and then I've now spent the past three and a half years at CARE, largely because I just love nonprofits and I, I really love the work culture of them. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I didn't, you know, start my career knowing that I would get into the humanitarian um, sector. But after the 2016 election, um, I was really itching to tell stories about the people worldwide that were being impacted by the policies coming out of the White House. And um, that's what brought me to CARE. Um, and it's just been an absolute joy to, to learn about the work that CARE has been doing um, and to really see some, some very impactful change that we've had even in the previous administration. Um, and yeah, that's, that's where I am now. Yeah. Savannah, can, are you with us? Yeah, I think I have better service now. So I'm gonna turn my video on hopefully. Um, so interesting enough, I did not know that Allison used to work at National Geographic. I've known her for almost four years. So that's amazing. I'm learning something new. Um, I would say really my background started with my grandmother and my mother. So I come from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a Southern girl through and through, um, but everyone in my family is actually a public school teacher. Um, I always say that I'm not strong enough <laughs> for that job. I find it one of the hardest jobs that, that folks could do, but I think Growing up in a family of educators, I really heard a lot of stories of education of women and girls getting educated, especially from my grandmother of how that can impact your life moving forward, but also just the way that a community really rallies around them. Um, and so that's really where a lot of the conversations and my values base came from. Beginning in high school, I got engaged with Amnesty International, um, human rights work uh, around the world and here domestically in the US. And through that, I went to college, studied international relations like Kellen, had a big focus on how foreign policy, the US foreign policy impacts other countries. Uh, but right out of college, joined Amnesty International as a field organizer um, and really went through the ranks, national field organizer, uh, senior campaigner, did a lot of global campaigns for Amnesty and was there for about eight or nine years. Um, and so really my background is in organizing, mobilizing and campaigning but similar to, to Allison, after the 2016 election, I realized that a lot of things were gonna change. Um, and what I really wanted to focus on is how the US and advocates within the US could do defensive advocacy. Because um, we knew a lot of bad 
policies were about to start coming out. Um, and so that's where I really made the jump to care in February, 2017. So I came on right as Kellen came on as well. We were kind of buddies getting, getting used to care at the same time. Um, and so I've been with care for about four and a half years so far. Great, great. I know that um, none of you really have overseas field work uh, experience. Um, so I'm going to weigh in a little bit here, as I mentioned before, um, you know, obviously there's so many skill sets that you can apply to this kind of work, whether it's marketing or, or uh, writing or communication or um, policy work. Um, I actually remember when I first started as an advocate for care, I brought Maeve, my granddaughter, with me to the first meeting, and she became completely hooked on the idea of working in the policy area. She's now 20 and in college and she's still an advocate for CARE and CARE had a, a huge influence on her decision um, based on what she wants to do for the rest of her life. So, you know, policy work, legislation, that kind of thing. There's so many different skills that you can bring. Um, and I want to bring in the private sector here because um, obviously uh, business development, especially when you're talking about empowering women, you know, entrepreneurship and finding solutions. Um, Innovative solutions to the world's problems is a huge asset and a huge part of what CARE needs. So when I went to Benin, Africa with CARE a couple of years ago, um, I got to see on the ground what, uh, what you do and how you work with other organizations. I met up with all kinds of organizations. It's really quite interesting how everybody you know, has very limited resources and everybody just joins together to get the work done. And that's all they care about. So. I, uh, I had some favorite programs, but I blew my mind how much the private sector was involved and the kinds of technology or um, the kinds of solutions that were brought, um, you know, to the, the problems that we find. And so, you know, I saw work that was involved in uh, business development, especially with women, you know, the empowerment of women in, in particular, um, the, the healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies and technology to help with that as well as education, gender-based violence, social justice, all of these things. And, you know, um, I, I'll bring up a couple of programs. Um, one was the um, Village Savings and Loan Association program. I love that program. So we went out to a couple of villages and watched that in action. And this was a program that was developed by CARE and is worldwide now. And basically uh, the villages who participate have their own committee it's all women <clears throat> and they have a, uh, they, 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 uh, the, the community or the village contributes to the savings and loan program, maybe 50 cents a week. It all goes into a savings account, which is actually a, a box, um, like a safety box with four locks on it, four different people, you know, have keys to the locks and they give micro loans out and they have 100% um, payback uh, because you're not gonna not pay back a loan that your village gave you. And in addition to that, a lot of education comes to um, the women that are involved. Uh, there is uh, one woman who is selected from each village who will then be sent out to look at what's going on in the, in the marketplace. And then she will come back and educate the other women. So we saw a lot of um, value chain, um, you know, a lot of work moving up the value chain because of these programs, a lot of seed um, capital obviously given to, to women. So maybe a woman would have uh, sold um, her vegetables at the local market, but then decided because she had access to a little bit of seed money that she would actually uh, produce a product from the vegetables so that she could sell it for a higher, a higher price. Um, but what was fascinating was watching them run their own program when they really didn't, weren't empowered previous to that. Um, sometimes they would let the men uh, be involved, <laughs> but I loved watching their meetings because the children would stand around on the outside and watch them and were just fascinated by watching their mothers, grandmothers, sisters, aunts, whatever, involved in and making their own choices and building their businesses. And at a certain point, they, it becomes so um, prosperous for them that they just don't need care anymore. And that's the best part. When they're like, we're great now. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for your help. And that's, that's the best part. Another program I saw was uh, brought by a couple of technology firms, young 30-year-olds, um, um, 
a software program for to work with pregnant women that were very remote. Um, and so it was a handheld uh, device with a special software program where you could um, ask or you could tell it was it was to connect with a doctor who was in the next closest town and you could talk about what your issues are um, as a pregnant um, woman. Um, are you having you know health problems and then he would tell you what you should do with those issues and whether you needed to come into to town. Um, and it was extremely successful, but there were huge obstacles that had to do with cultural, embedded cultural issues. Um, so I saw how they worked out those, those obstacles or worked past those obstacles, and it, that was absolutely fascinating. It saved hundreds and hundreds of lives, and this, was, this all came from the private sector. Um, so just saw a lot of amazing work, and uh, especially uh, with young people, you know, taking hold of their future and of their community and of their uh, country and dealing with things like gender issues and social justice and corruption. You'll find a lot of young people in developing countries are absolutely sick of, of corruption and they're taking sort of charge and it's a wonderful, amazing thing to see. So um, there are just so many skill sets that can be applied. Um, so if you're coming from the private sector, you know, there are a, a lot of skill sets that can, that can be applied to this um, to create effective programs. So I don't know, have you guys seen any um, cool technologies that apply to your work at all or you know, any help from the private sector that you can talk about? <laughs> we do a lot of work actually with the private sector around advocacy specifically. So um, CARE more broadly engages with um, corporations on specific projects for fundraising, those kind of things. But within our team, we have a group of, I think, six different corporations that we meet with monthly to seek their advice, to see where there's kind of common ground where we can advocate for the foreign assistance budget, for example, um, different priorities, whether that is just making a phone call, sharing intelligence, or even we've done like Hill Days with our CEO, um, Michelle Nunn. So these bigger corporations all have like either like a corporate social responsibility thing, and they all kind of have their own causes. But I definitely think there has been a lot of good opportunities for us to collaborate and kind of think outside the box in the way that we work with the private sector outside of just them giving us money for a specific project. Right, right. Savannah or Allison, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we also get a lot of support, um, you know, to, to kind of, have new technologies in the field, you know, as you were saying, Don, um, and, you know, also kind of making sure that people are aware of our work. Um, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot of support with, you know, um, getting PSAs, public service announcements out to, um, you know, the, the people that we work with and, um, and the people who support care, um, and really allowing people to, to get a, a look at what care does. You know, I think that um, it's really important to understand what we do as a country in the, in the realm of foreign affairs. And a lot of people think that a huge amount of our budget goes to foreign um, uh, aid. Like most people think it's about 25% and it's really more than more like what 1%. Um, and the impact, I'm also on a, a, the US Global Leadership Coalition Board for New Hampshire and you know, so we talk about this a lot, but the impact on, on Homeland Security is also very, very um, much affected by our foreign policy and uh, what we do in terms of foreign aid. Um, you know, if you remember the famous um, comment by General Mattis when he was um, appearing before Congress and um, about foreign aid budget and when they just, they were going to, to, uh, to uh, lower the budget, um, he said, well, then you, probably should give me more money for bullets because that's what's going to happen. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, that's quite amazing. Um, so in terms of, of individuals and, and businesses, is what can we do to, to be more involved and, and more supportive? Allison, do you want to talk about that? Or Savannah? Or I mean, I can, I can start. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, and 
you know, this is probably coming from the fact that I work on, you know, marketing and, and communications for care, but I think education is just really critical for everybody, whether it be the general public or whether it be a, a for profit or corporation. Um, it's just so important to to stay educated about what's happening around the world. As you said, Don, um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about um, you know, things like how much is the U.S. actually um, providing in, in global assistance. And when people learn the numbers, when people learn the impact in particular of, of what some of those very, very small numbers actually do, it just opens their eyes and, and opens their mind. Um, and I think, you know, we're all better for that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I would say. But again, I'm coming from a, a marketing and communications background, so that's probably not surprising. Yeah, I, um, I, you know, it's because I'm an advocate, I know this, but it's really important um, to make sure that your legislators know that you are, that these policies are important to you. So, you know, there are certain things that are really obvious, like violence against women acts and, um, you know, global food security and that kind of thing. And if you're educated in that and you run into your, um, your legislator and just bring that up, it's hugely important. Um, we had at one point one legislator that was not interested in the Global Food Security Act, um, and I just wouldn't let him, you know, off the hook. And it actually, uh, and I got about 50 of his constituents to call him, and he ended up changing his vote, and, and we got it passed. So, you know, we in New England tend to interact a lot with um, our congressional delegation. So this is something that's like super important. If these things are important to you, um, which they should be, um, then that's uh, the kind of activity that would really be effective. So um, is there, do you, do you feel like there's anything that we in the developing or the developed world do that um, has a negative effect on the developing world? Or is that too uh, edgy of a question? <laughs> um, I don't think it's too edgy of a question. I think it's something that CARE as an organization grapples with every day. You know, we're based in Atlanta as a U.S. organization. We have about 10,000 people working worldwide. And a lot of our work in the places, you know, where we have programming is led by the people that live in those countries and those communities. But that's something that we're always kind of thinking of is like, we're, are we making decisions about priorities and you know our advocacy for example that's based on what we in the u.s kind of think that the the people that we serve need or are we making sure that we're purposefully engaging them so that they're able to lead on the advocacy articulate what is helpful you know for them because it's their lives their community their families um and just making sure that like we're doing our best to support these locally led efforts versus like a top-down approach so it's something that not just care, I'm sure all different organizations grapple with um, to make sure that we're doing the best we can to support the people that we serve and not the other way around. Right. Yeah, good, good, good point. Um, you know, some, one thing I noticed when I was overseas was the detrimental effect it has on local business when you give clothes and shoes and things like that. Um, and it's, nothing, it's something I felt stupid that I had never thought of but I know a lot of um, organizations will collect clothing and, and things like that and send them overseas when it's actually having a negative effect on local business. Um, you know, money is a lot better, but um, that's something that a lot of people don't realize. And I feel almost bad saying it because I know that people um, donate thinking they're doing something good, but it actually has quite a bad effect on, on people who are actually trying to be entrepreneurs and trying to run businesses because if they provide something that somebody can get for free, you know, so that you have to have a little bit of a, a balance there. And also, um, you know, we have to think about uh, the spillover effect on um, what each of us in developing countries do relative to, to the sustainable um, development goals of, you know, 20, starting in 2015 for 2030, uh, you know, what we export, what we import, um, you know, the effect that we have on the environment, on um, education on, um, um, uh, on the economy and that kind of thing. So, you know, um, but that's a whole nother uh, conversation. So what programs are you particularly proud of? 
Don, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll just add in, I think one of the, the big programs that we're really proud of is the advocacy work. And I think it gets back to how the US has a positive or negative influence. Um, one of the things that you brought up earlier, Don, was the global gag rule, the Mexico City policy rule, and, and how that kind of gets batted back and forth between Republican and, and Democratic presidents, and how that has a tremendous effect on the providers of healthcare for women and girls around the world when, you know, within six months, they can have their entire funding cut off from the US and how detrimental that is. And so looking at how the US foreign policy can really stabilize a lot of programs um, moving forward. And, and I think the sexual and reproductive health programs that we have around the world is, is one of the programs that I'm really proud of because it allows women to have full autonomy over their bodies and, and family plan and, and be healthy um, and provide for their families. So I think um, combining those two questions uh, is, is really important. Yeah, I saw actually the work that you do on the ground in terms of uh, reproductive health. And um, this is always a, a very touchy subject to bring up if you're an advocate um, when you're talking to you know, certain people. And um, you know, basically all it is is giving women access to uh, the ability to, to, to space their pregnancies and to time their pregnancies and to have as many or as little as they'd like. It's nothing to do, it has nothing to do with abortion or advocating for abortion, I'll just say it straight out. It has to do with helping families to um, you know, space and time their, 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 their offspring. So um, it, it was really interesting watching how um, these programs, I was at a, um, um, a clinic for um, women who had just had babies and they came in for vaccinations and you offered them, this is again in Benin, you offered them the ability to talk about, um, 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 oh God, it's been so long, um, um, birth control, sorry. <laughs> um, you can tell how long I've been, I since I've been on birth control. Okay, so birth control and um, but it wasn't anything you were forcing or advocating. It's just, would you like some information on, on birth control? And the women were just so happy to be able to learn about what their options were. And I also, um, and, I, and, and it actually is a really fascinating if you're interested in cross-cultural uh, issues and, and you know, if you were an anthropology person, um, you know, just looking at how how careful you have to be. So we're a bunch of white people coming into Africa talking about uh, birth control. And, and you know, sometimes the reaction is, why do you want us to stop having children when all you're talking about is keeping people healthy, keeping babies healthy, you know, and learning how to space pregnancies. And all of these women, you know, wanted the help because, you know, I, I, I met one woman who was 20 and already had five kids and she was exhausted. And so little by little, based on the kind of, of information and communication that you came up with, the men then got involved as well. And you know, the mothers-in-law who were a huge influence also you know, understood what it was that, that they were being offered. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's not just going in and saying, here's some birth control. It's, there's a whole background to, to doing that and understanding the embedded culture. So it was something that I was, you know, really proud of as well as the economic empowerment um, of women. So, um, you know, it was, it was, it gives me goosebumps to think about what I saw in terms of the effectiveness, you know, seeing hundreds of lives saved in less than two years, you know, seeing women um, being economically empowered in a short period of time. And, you know, the whole, uh, the effect just was exponential and you know, as we know, when women are empowered, um, it has an immediate and exponential effect on their families and on their communities because um, it has been proven that they give back immediately to educating their children, to, to feeding their children and back to the community. So it's just has an immediate effect. Um, so I wanna take some, some um, questions from the audience and I see uh, Ursula is asking, um, how does CARE decide where to put their focus? That's a, yeah, I can jump in. That's a really great question, question, Ursula. I think one of the things that we try to do is because we have 
the programs in, in 100 different countries, we really tried to get information from the folks that are on the ground. And so our staff that are on the ground telling us where we need to focus, what the community needs, and allowing the affected communities to, to tell us. I think the second part is we know that the needs would outweigh the capacity that we have. And so really looking at what infrastructure we have and where we can make the best impact. And that goes into a lot of our strategy of focusing down um, on a couple different programs or within the advocacy program, focusing on two to three really priority issues that we are gonna put our full force behind. So we're not spread out so thin, um, but really focusing on where we can make the biggest impact, I think is really important. And that goes back to just doing a quick look at what our infrastructure is and, and where we can have the biggest say. And just and adding on to what Savannah said too, we're you know we're constantly adjusting based on the political landscape. So we did all of this kind of scenario planning before this last election, like for a Trump second term or for a Biden Harris administration, and kind of planning those out. Every new Congress, you know, you talked about your senators in in New Hampshire, and so we have a, you know our target list, and we kind of tweak those as the political landscape shifts, just like I'm sure you would at in the private sector if you know there was economic factors or societal factors that were affecting your work. So it's um, uh, constantly kind of experimenting and, and strategizing depending on how things are changing. Yep. Um, so um, you're also being asked, I think you might have answered this, but if you want to expand on that, um, how much do you have to be mindful of current government policies? Well, I guess I can jump in a lot. <laughs> <laughs> to be uh, very, very mindful. Um, but I think that, you know, care is, um, you know, we are nonpartisan. And so, um, you know, regardless of, um, you know, who's, who's in US Congress, who's, who's in the White House, um, care engages um, across across the aisle, um, both sides of the aisle. And I think, um, you know, care advocacy is is really really good at you know kind of towing the line and um you know because i think at the end of the day you know don is as i think you've alluded to you know this is not really about politics this is about saving lives and so um you know of course we always look at the current political landscape and we think about how do we need to adjust our messaging how do we need to adjust our, our targets the members of congress who we're reaching out to to have the greatest impact that may change based on every, you know, every Congress, every administration, um, but our goals are always the same. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I, I don't know if you can weigh in on this, but uh, I know that you've had some pushback from you know certain members of Congress because there's maybe a misperception or misconception of what you do or what we do or what we advocate for. Um, and but I think you've had some successes in sort of you know, making some of those people actual supporters and advocates for care. Um, do you, can you talk about what kinds of misconceptions a lot of these legislators have? Um, I can talk about yeah. one of them. No, go ahead, Savannah. No, Kellen, you go first and then I'll add on. I was just gonna say, I can talk about one of them. I think one of the, the misconceptions that's, that's pretty broad is about how much the United States invests in foreign assistance compared to you know, all the money within the, the US budget. Um, and it's about 1%, a little bit more than 1%. Um, but consistently those numbers come back like 20% or something super, super high. And one of the things that I'm really proud of at CARE and have worked kind of on and off in the past is our Learning Tours program. So that's where similar kind of to the trip that Dawn took to the knee and where we take members of Congress, their staffers, journalists, other kind of influential people to the field to see not only CARES program work, but those of other organizations, um, projects that are funded by the US government or other countries, so that they can see firsthand, meet our program participants, hear their stories, and kind of see firsthand um, you know, what foreign assistance supports. And then when they come back, then we have this whole network, we call them alumni, of folks that have seen this work, seen the value, and, and really sometimes have changed their tune. And to become, you know, champions and supporters of, of CARES work, but also more broadly of, you know, work in this humanitarian sphere. So um, just one of the, the ways that CARE engages to kind of educate and, and change minds over time. 
Kellen, I think that was great. And the only other thing I would add on is I think there's a misperception of what USAID actually is. And a lot of members of Congress, I feel like still have that idea of we're still just sending care packages. Um, and Don, like you've talked about our programs, it goes so much wider and so much deeper. Um, and so being able to take members of Congress over to actually see the village and savings and loans associations and, and seeing how we're doing that, seeing how um, cash assistance works with sending cash through cell phones and seeing the technology come through and seeing how effective it can be. I think that has really started to, to make a shift in how we see what we need to to invest in with foreign assistance and how much we need to give. Um, I think there's been a really big shift on resilience too, of how do we make communities resilient? And so they don't need that constant US foreign aid coming in, um, which programs you know, provide that stability and that resilience moving forward. I think that's also been a very big shift. So the Village Savings and Loan Association program actually is about resilience as well. I forgot to mention that it was about micro loans, um, you know, for small businesses, but it's also a savings program in case something happens in the village and they need um, cash to, you know, if there's a flood or a drought or whatever. Um, so that's, a, you know, makes that's what makes it a little bit different than the typical micro loan program. Um, so um, so yeah, that's why I loved it so much. So what what um, what legislation right now are you um, advocating for? What what pieces? What policies? Or are there any particular pieces of legislation that are important to care? Well, I'll talk about the big one, um, the fast and fair vaccine campaign that we're doing. Um, this is something that we started last fall and that we're going to be continuing. Um, we know that COVID nineteen isn't just gonna stop, um, that we need to continue to do it for the next couple of years. And so one of the big things that we've been pushing is how much the United States can provide in funding and vaccines for, for others around the world. And that's something that we're gonna continue to do. Um, Don, you know that we've had a huge win um, this spring with the funding uh, that we've been able to, to push the United States to give. Um, that $18 billion was, was really fundamental to, to how the, the world is responding. And so that's gonna be something that we continue to work on at least for the next three years as we make sure that vaccines are rolled out around the world. Oh yeah, I actually just got a question about where the, your funding comes from. So that's sort of like a add on to what you were just talking about. Yeah, we have multiple streams. And so some of it is US grants. Um, so working with USAID and getting that programmatic funding um, we get money from corporations. Um, so like Kellen was speaking about earlier, the corporations that we work with, they do a lot of funding, whether it's different programs, um, such as Mars doing funding for different programs that work with agricultural in, in Africa, uh, where cocoa beans are coming from, or uh, Cargill in, in several different countries. Um, and then we have private donors as well. Um, so what we would call major donors. Um, we have a fantastic team of staff that work just with individual donors and major donors um, where we get funding. So we have multiple different uh, streamlines of, of funding. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I forget, I should have looked up this number, I forget, but we have a lot of, um, of contributors from you know, in New Hampshire. I was actually surprised when I first saw that number. Um, I have a question from, no, I can't find it. Oh, from Catherine Polios, who's with uh, Rain for the Stay Hell in the Sahara. Hey, Catherine, um, <clears throat> in New Hampshire, great organization. Um, and she's asking, can you talk a little about the array of opportunities available at CARE and what kinds of backgrounds slash skill sets slash experiences are prioritized in hiring? She is particularly interested in how the opportunities for Americans are shifting as there's greater focus uh, on filling international roles with, with local staff. Yeah, I can go first and then maybe Allison and Kellen, you guys, <clears throat> you guys work on different, different areas that we can jump in. Um, that's a great question. I think one of the greatest things that CARE has is 
90% of our staff around the world are actually located in the countries that they're from. And so there are local populations, which means they know the language, they know the culture, they know the people. So that's really helpful. I think on the flip side within the United States, CARE is a very large organization for international development. And so there is just a plethora of opportunities you can see the different backgrounds that that Allison and Kellen and I have, but also looking at folks that work with our corporate partners, the majority of them are from private sectors. You have our digital team, you have events team. So if you're really good at event planning, um, there's spaces for that as well. Our fundraising team, like I mentioned, um, is really great and that ranges from actual major Okay, so we just we're losing you again. Um, <clears throat> you guys want to jump in a little bit? Donors, um, and <laughs> working with major donors and developing major donors. Um, to corporations, some of our under other funding, which I forgot to mention, foundation, um, the Eleanor Cook. Um, so there's a ton of different apps. Okay, I think maybe she's back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <go ahead. laughs> But I think what um, Savannah said is so true. You can have just about any skill and work at a nonprofit, especially a nonprofit as large as Care. Um, you know. We, we need everybody from, you know, IT and digital support to marketing and communications. And then, of course, the, there's the, you know, public policy and um, fundraising and corporate. I mean, there's just, like I said, especially for a nonprofit as big as CARE, there's so many opportunities. Um, and, you know, I, like I said earlier, I, I went to school for journalism. I, I, you know, I think it's a really big misstep. And, you know, we don't really teach people that you can have a job in, in nonprofits. Um, and, um, but like I said, you can, you can really apply so many different skills um, to, to nonprofits. Um, I think as long as you have a passion for the mission of, of where you are, you're, you're set. Um, and that's the other great thing about nonprofits is that there's basically a nonprofit for almost anything, right? And so if you have a passion for something, you most likely can find, um, you know, a, a nonprofit organization that fits that. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. My granddaughter, like I said, is is studying a double major in environmental science and economics, and her plan is to go work for uh, either USAID or a nonprofit. And she's going to major. She's going to do her graduate studies probably in international agriculture. But you know, we just talked a lot about that stuff. But I can tell you, like I said, her friends hadn't really thought about working in the nonprofit world and and they probably are very well aligned to doing that kind of work so i wish you know we would talk to people a little bit more about those career um avenues and i wanted to say <clears throat> i wanted to ask you actually do you do any work in niger does, does care do work in niger yeah does, i'm sorry does care do work in niger we do. Yeah, so that's where Catherine's um, focus is and, um, you know, her organization. So um, probably anybody that's on, um, that's there with the uh, experience that they've had with me, with um, her organization could actually also apply that to work that CARE does because uh, you, you do have a lot of on in-country uh, staff, mostly in-country staff. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I have a question. Um, what are some of your, from Heather O'Brien, what are some of your current largest programs in which you are partnering with the United Nations and where in the world? Well, one of, the, I'm not sure if it's like a program specifically, but one of the things that we've been dedicating a lot of our time and our energy is the upcoming um, United Nations Food System Summit. So. CARE has been involved in coalition with other organizations to kind of help set that agenda to make sure that, you know, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, nonprofits have a seat at the table to kind of shape that agenda and those commitments and those different kind of pillars. So I know that um, my colleague, Christine, 
is working on that tirelessly until I think it happens in September or October um, for that. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a, a lot. Um, you know, I think as um, Kellen said, you know, we certainly partner with the, the UN on a lot of their food and nutrition security work. We also partner a lot with um, the uh, UN Generation Equality Forum is also coming up. Um, so we do a lot of work with the UN around gender equality, women's equality, um, and, uh, you know, certainly also with, um, you know, uh, Violence against women and and maternal health. Um, we do a lot of um, work with the UN as well. I know that the uh, funding for the trip I went on came from the UN, the UN as well. Um, you know, was there uh, was the, their idea? I think, but anyway, they funded so that advocates could actually see on the ground. Like, you know, I think I might have said this, or maybe not. But I was always a committed advocate. But when I saw the programs on the ground and the lives that were saved and bettered, I became absolutely an absolute fierce advocate. So it was well worth the money. Um, you know, I uh, can, it's very nice to be able to talk from a firsthand knowledge of exactly how these programs work and exactly how they're handled and how they're run and, and how they're communicated, um, exactly what they do and do not do. So, uh, and that came from the United Nations. Um, someone was asking if um, you get any funding from the Gates Foundation. Yes. <laughs> We've have a, we have a really great relationship with the Gates Foundation, actually. Like, I don't know how many years it goes back, but it goes back really well. And our relationship with them has evolved and they help fund our learning course program, for example, and some of our other advocacy work as well. Great, great. Um, so also Ursula was asking um, what other nonprofits does CARE uh, collaborate with? Because um, we're thinking about some local um, organizations. She's part of the Junior League, for instance, of Boston. And you know, obviously these or local organizations could help spread the word as well. So what kind of other nonprofits do you collaborate with? I'll, I'll try to speak and, and I'm sorry if I'm a little bit delayed. Um, we work with a lot of different coalitions on the national level for our policies. And then Don, like you were speaking to, the local work that we do is a lot of it is actually through our advocates. And so whether it's working with um, food pantries around food security, um, like we do in Philadelphia, or other organizations that are really local that have connections to the businesses and to our advocates. Um, it can really range um, from, like I mentioned, food pantries to women's shelters that work on gender equality and, and international violence against women. Um, it's really any organization, any, any um, coalition that works on our issues, we really partner with that. Um, and a lot of that is through educating the community um, and doing events with members of Congress. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I locally, I've spoken at a lot of um, different events and, and uh, uh, for different organizations just to talk about what we do and uh, talk about partnering and spreading the word and, and uh, you know, just foreign aid in general. So, um, yeah, so that's actually a very good question. Um, <clears throat> anybody else have any, any other questions? Oh, let's see. Uh, what does your collaboration look like in the field? Is most of your work carried out directly by local care staff or do you partner or subcontract with local NGOs abroad? I think it's a combination of both. I think it depends on how the grant or the program is kind of structured, but mm -hmm. we do a lot of work with local organizations that we might not even, like that I might not even recognize their name because they're so hyper-local to you know to carry that work out whether it's like building latrines or you know doing something like you know setting up infrastructure that kind of thing so they kind of source out that uh that work with local organizations and local vendors as much as possible yeah i would say it's a little bit of both especially when you think about you know wherever care works we you know really try to set up a community so that if care leaves if care can no longer be there the community can still you know, be resilient, can can still do what they need to do. And so that's certainly where a lot of, you know, the, the local organizations on the ground, 
it's really important to, to partner with them to kind of empower them and, and build them up to be able to be resilient. Um, so yeah, absolutely a, a combination of both. So um, I saw a lot of collaboration when I was there um, and all of the programs that I, I, I mean, I was in all kinds of villages and, and looking at all kinds of programs. I was in hospitals, I was in um, sort of the, um, with organizations um, and I saw a lot of on the ground collaboration even where it was kind of hidden. Because so what I saw was um, people on the ground, uh, people who are with NGOs and local um, uh, organizations who really just wanna get the work done who are tired of seeing people starve to death and who are tired of seeing you know, gender-based violence and that kind of thing. And so um, I saw, for instance, um, a, a faction of the Dutch embassy working with CARE on uh, a program when they had been take, when the funding had been taken away because you know, they had reduced funding for whatever reason, but the people on the ground were like, no, we're not gonna, we're just gonna hide it and do this work. I saw faith-based organizations working on um, uh, maternal health issues when it probably wasn't necessarily uh, in their ethos to do so, but it's because it needed to be done. But a lot of the local organizations, um, you know, working together. So I think in this case, um, offline, I'm going to talk to you guys about partnering with Catherine's organization in Niger, um, because I know that there's a great, uh, they've been doing great work. Um, you know, in Niger for many, many years. I know the founder. Um, and so there is absolutely no reason it would be a great partnership to you know, partner. So oh, Catherine, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, make that happen. Um, so see if you guys can partner in Niger. So I think that's super exciting. Um, so let's see, Heather is asking, which areas of the world or countries do you find the most challenging right now and why? Um, and she's talking relative to political conflict um, or other conflicts, economic, geographic, or other challenges. I don't know, Kellen, Savannah, if you want to I mean, I think, unfortunately, there's probably a lot of countries um, that, that we can list that are rather difficult right now. Um, you know, what what comes to mind is really, um, you know, Latin America, um, you know, for the past couple of years, um, you know, it's been a really, yeah. oh, uh, Savannah meant to jump in there. Um, uh, Latin America has, has been, you know, a really challenging political, um, you know, environment. And, you know, for the past couple of years, we just really saw astronomical numbers of, you know, women and girls who were facing violence, people who were facing food insecurity, um, largely coming out of that, um, you know, political conflict. And, you know, now with COVID-19, we know that just all of those issues are just made worse. Um, they're, they're not going away. COVID-19 um, just exacerbates all those, those numbers and, and all those injustices. Um, and of course, you know, if things were really challenging before COVID-19, um, you know, even, you know, now it's, it's even harder. I think we're, we're, you know, learning a lot about, you know, how we can work in, in Latin America and other places given COVID. Um, but yeah, that's, that's you know, what, what kind of came to my mind. I don't know if Kellen and Spana have others that are top of mind. Um, I would also, I think on top of Latin America, I think sub Sahara Africa, um, I think you have this combination of extreme climate change, which is affecting food insecurity, which is forcing migration, on top of a lot of political instability in, in many of the countries there. And then on top of having COVID um, really ramp up right now and, and having a really hard time getting protective uh, equipment to, to members or to um, members of the community there. I think all of those are really kind of creating a challenging aspect 
not just to get programming on the ground, but to actually get the, whether it's food security and, and, and sending aid in, um, getting that aid to those people that are in need, I think it's been very, very Sorry, so I'm losing you again. Um, uh, um, in that, that aspect as well. Yeah. So I, uh, what comes to my mind is refugee uh, work. Um, so in particular, Syria. And um, I know that um, women suffer tremendously. Um, women refugees, like what is something like, tell me if I've got the numbers wrong, one in three um, is abused. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, the whole climate change situation and uh, climate change uh, refugees, um, it's becoming, you know, the worst humanitarian crisis ever. Um, but I know that um, it's just like a domino effect. And so the refugees, and I, I CARE does a lot of great work in feeding um, uh, refugees. And I know that there have been some issues um, that you've had to sort of obstacles again that you've had to work around. I remember hearing about um, uh, providing food to families and that you found that a lot of times when you would provide the food to men, like the, you know, the head of the family, head of the household, they would a lot of times be selling their, their food on the way back to, you know, they would sell it for cigarettes or whatever. So you had to start providing it just to women only because women would actually take the food back to the family. So it's, it's just quite interesting um, what kinds of issues that you encounter when you're in the field. And um, I'm just looking at notes from Heather. So Heather, it looks like you were, um, <clears throat> you know, that you did a lot of humanitarian work in war zones, that you were a UN peacekeeper. And uh, I hope you're a member of um, World, uh, Women in World Trade, because I love to talk to you. But um, yeah, it's, it's cool to hear. Uh, about that work that you did. So maybe sometime we can talk and maybe you'd like to become an advocate for care in New England. So great, good, Heather, she's at, she's, she's a long time member, awesome. <laughs> All right, any other questions from anybody? Oh, okay, we know each other, she says. Yeah, yeah your name sounds familiar, okay. Um, sounds like I'm having a one-sided conversation but I'm actually not just talking to myself, so. <laughs> um, anybody, anybody else have questions? So, uh, oh, sorry. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, we uh, want to continue sort of this conversation on um, um, humanitarian aid and especially international economic development and how that affects, you know, the trade world and the, um, you know, entrepreneurship. I'm really interested in how, you know, um, new technologies can help solve some of these problems. So, we're hoping to sort of continue this. Um, you know, later in the year, maybe um, I would love to have someone from AIB come and talk, especially Samantha Power, since she's, you know, lives in Massachusetts um, and, and she's now the head of AID. It would be really cool to have her talk about what AID does. Um, I wanted to just a couple of housekeeping um, things. I wanted to let you know that um, we are going to be sending out a letter next week, uh, which will give you some information, all of the upcoming programs that we have. Um, I look, Bay just, um, yeah, is putting up a screen. Um, so you'll be getting a calendar of all the upcoming events. So we're taking a little break over the summer, but our next event is gonna be on September 29th. We'll be talking to some CEOs, uh, women CEOs around the world. Um, and um, we have a lot of great events planned for the rest of the year. I'm super excited about our December event where we are um, going to be having a reception at the home of the Turkish Consul General. So that's going to be uh, really awesome. And, you know, no problem. Savannah's apologizing for her connection issues, but, you know, she's on vacation and she's on a road trip. So thank you for participating, um, Savannah, Allison, and Kellen. And if anybody wants to know more about working with CARE, um, contact me, please. Um, you don't have to do fundraising, which everybody hates, and just advocate, and I'm happy to teach you how to do that. Also, I have to say that um, the hopefully we'll meet in person next year. The annual um, 
meeting that we go to is amazing. We have the most amazing speakers. We have so much fun. You know, like I said, it's like, you know, meeting with your tribe, but we have, you know, friends all over the country um, and uh, also celebrities show up and it's, it's just a lot of fun. And then we hit the hill and we advocate for policy and legislation and it's, um, it's a pretty, pretty cool thing. So let me know if you want to know more about, about care and how you can work with care.